Hello class and welcome to this A Link to the Past walkthrough right here on Video Games 101 by way of Let's Play with Briggins. I'm your instructor, Professor Briggins, and it's not every day you get to do a, a walkthrough class on one of the greatest games in the history of games. This is one of the greatest action-adventure RPGs of all time, one of the greatest games in general of all time. A very strong title in the Legend of Zelda series. We have a very beautiful descriptive, dramatic intro here to start things off to uh, get everyone on the same page as to what's going on. But you know the one thing they always leave out of this intro that bothers me? The dance party. I've said it once and I'll say it again, the Japanese just do commercials better, particularly for this game. Who can forget when <laughs> Princess Zelda was captured? Speaking of which, update our Rescue the Princess trope list to include this game. But yes, she was captured and to rescue her, Link organized a massive choreographed dance party. You can tell she's very frightened, but don't worry, nothing a massive dance party <laughs> can't solve. Look at those special effects. Just fantastic. A lot of folks will argue it was the sword in that situation, but do not underestimate the power of a well choreographed Japanese dancing spectacular to put Ganon in his place. He respects and we just keep dancing. I love it. In terms of difficulty, I'm going to go ahead and give A Link to the Past a 5 out of 10. On the frustration scale, this equates to throwing your controller across the room. Probably when you're very close to taking down that boss, but they get that last little lick on you. Didn't have a fairy in your bottle at that stage, but fear not. We have the most complete Link to the Past walkthrough you will find all the secrets will be covered, the fastest route to getting all the items you need to make this game much more manageable, just the fastest route to beating this game in general without leaving a single thing out. This is a very long game, we have all of our TAs standing by, ready to give you all the tips you need to succeed in this game, so let's run the intro and get into this Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past walkthrough right here on Video Games 101. Amazing. start a new game and put our name right here. We get the full professor. Now I think we're limited to seven characters. No love for the Thaddeuses and Jacqueline's of the world. But we uh, start out in our uncle's house. This is one of the rare examples of a Zelda game where, which features another member of our family. I know we're doing the Wind Waker right now at the time of this particular class over on my main channel, Let's Play with Brigands. Playing through that with my my good friend Matt, and uh, our grandmother is heavily featured. Not Matt and mine, but Link's grandmother is featured in that game. But there goes our uncle. We could spend the whole game in bed, but we got adventuring to do. We have our first item. Uh, let's go to Blaze. All right, the lamp allows Link to see a limited range, as well as light some torches in, uh, in certain areas to temporarily light the whole room. You gotta get right up on it though, but there you go, the lamp. Thanks, Blaze. As we take a look now at the controls for Link to the Past, nothing too crazy here. It's all set up very well. Hold that attack button to charge up our spin attack. Does a bit more damage and does a nice 360 to hit everyone around us. Do pretty much everything else with A and items with Y, and we can hit start to bring up our items menu. As we pick up this bush right here with A, go into the secret entrance to the castle since they won't let us in the front, and oh no. Our uncle lasted all of what, 50 seconds? But he gives us uh, the sword and shield and blaze. What do we got? All right, the first sword and shield we get are pretty useless. Don't tell your uncle that, although I guess that would be kind of difficult at this point, but uh, we'll be upgrading both before too long, but in the meantime, better than nothing. Fair point. Hopefully we won't have to slum it with that too long, but let's take a look now at the Briggs notes in this Link to the Past walkthrough. Pretty much just follow this guide and uh, get the upgrades as soon as possible. That's what we're going to show you in this game. Nothing groundbreaking in terms of strategy. We're just going to show you the 
the fastest and easiest way to go through this game, which of course does involve picking up a lot of the most valuable items as early as possible to give yourself a leg up. Now we're going to head right in the front door of the castle here. Going to veer left from the start. Don't really have to worry about taking down any guards or anything like that. We're not too concerned about money at this stage in the game and don't have access to any other items that they could replenish right now anyway. You can grab those small hearts to refill your total right there. That's pretty straightforward. We also have three different denominations of rupees in this game, the currency of Hyrule. We have the greens, which count for one, the blues, which count for five, and then the reds, which count for 20. We have our first key as well. We'll bring Blaze in a little bit later to talk about the different items for the dungeons. At the moment, this dungeon is as simple as it gets, very linear. They give you everything you need as you progress. It's fun to knock these guys off into the dark. <laughs> I guess I just said it's fun to kill these folks, but you know, that's what you get for being on the wrong side, presumably. Certainly on the wrong side of that ledge right there. <laughs> a little dark, a little dark, but uh, we can move statues a little bit later on. Not all statues move, but in some cases we'll use those to weight down some switches here and there as necessary. Sometimes you need to kill all the enemies on the screen or certain enemies to open the, the doors in a room. And opening this chest, we're going to have a fairly useful item right here. Got the boomerang, boys. Right, the boomerang freezes enemies. If it's a weak enemy, it can kill them outright. But there you go, a staple in the Legend of Zelda series. That's right, made its first appearance in the first Legend of Zelda game. I think they skipped it in Adventure of Link, but uh, got it back in this title and certainly a, a regular moving forward in the series. So we are now in the actual dungeon of the first dungeon where Zelda's being held. And this not even qualifies as a mini-boss, just pick up this pot right here, toss him at him, get one more, repeat the process. Got the special key, the big key if you will, to open up Zelda's cell. Go for the money first, not sure why there was a, a chest stored with her in the cell, but there you go. Wizard is an inhuman fiend, they always ask you if you understand, which I kind of resent at a certain point, you know? Yes, we're famously mute, but, you know, we're with you. We're on the same page here. So now we're just going to backtrack the exact same way we came. Princess won't really slow you down here. You may be thinking, well, Professor, that was a very quick and short resolution to the rescue the princess trope. Wait for it. I don't want to spoil anything here. I'm not going to assume you've played this before. If you haven't, this will help you all the more. Even if you have, I'm sure we're going to be able to teach you a thing or two. Again, we're going to bring in Fluff intermittently. We'll bring him in here in just a second to give you some fun facts about this classic of a game. Some things you may not know, may not have known beforehand, but uh, some certainly some interesting facts. A uh, handful of which I did not know myself before I played this. So, Actually, seeing as we're just backtracking right now, let's bring in Fluff for our first Fluff fact about The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. What do you got, Fluff? Like most video games, a lot of additional content was planned for The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past before time constraints limited what the developers were able to program into the game. For instance, series creator Shigeru Miyamoto had originally planned for this game to have a party system where you could switch between three characters and utilize their individual abilities. The developers also envisioned having several parallel worlds. This ambition proved to be too lofty, so in the end it was cut down to the two worlds of the light and dark as they appear in the game. That's very interesting, thank you Fluff, as Zelda's giving us directions here. Uh, it kind of sounds like they had a, a secret of mana kind of designs on that sort of game. Obviously before that game came out by a few years, but uh, yeah, that would have been very interesting to be able to switch between party members like that, but it all worked out in the end. <laughs> As we enter the sewers, or we're about to enter the sewers, behind and underneath Hyrule Castle, mind the rats, 
can light up the way just to see where we're going here. These enemies are a lot easier, the rats in particular. Not a bad place to grab some cash along the way as you head on out. A little bit later on in the game they use lighting the torches as a sort of mechanic for opening locked doors and triggering certain events, but uh, we're not at that stage in the game yet. Use your lantern right there and we can get a nice big swing to kill a lot of snakes in one hit right here. Make some cash, perhaps. One dollar, it's still cash. One rupee, I should say. You'll note that when you light a candle that it only lasts for so long, so... And it doesn't always extend to the next room on top of that either, so... Uh, just something to be aware of right here. So we grab a key. The max light you can get in one of these rooms is by lighting three different torches, so... If there's a fourth, you won't get any additional lighting. I think the low lighting works pretty well, though, in terms of being able to see your way around. Yeah, the sewers empty out into... well, not empty out. That's a very different meaning when you're talking sewers, but... They lead to the sanctuary, which I always thought was kind of strange. So we get a 20 spot right there, the rare red rupee we get from an enemy. Always very valuable, want to prioritize those whenever you see one. There's a few places in this game where we can get a bunch of money for nothing, essentially, not to get all dire straits there, but uh, there are some places where we can open a chest for a 300 in a rare instance or two, and uh, other denominations, much more than we can ever get from a single enemy. So that torch is going to go out, so yeah, you want to make sure you can identify where the next one is. Give yourself a little more working light. Occasionally enemies will leave behind a key, which we need to carry on to the next locked door. Sometimes you'll find them in a chest. You can see these uh, torches right here are still well maintained for whatever reason. You'll notice the door down there has some cracks in it, or the wall I should say, has some cracks in it which could lead to a door if we had some bombs. We don't have any right now, so we'll come back later for a a decent payday. Some decent items in there. Things get a little nicer as we climb up here. I suppose it makes more sense now. It is on a different floor, so the sewage is <laughs> down below it. Still can't smell good in that sanctuary, but I can see how it, it would make for a nice escape route if we needed it, or the exact opposite in this case. Pulling the left handle right there will drop a bunch of bombs for some reason. So the uh, priest doubles as a Kevin McAllister type. But here we are. Door opens up. Nice sanctuary music right here. Shout out to Koji Kondo, the music composer, longtime Nintendo music composer, obviously. Came up with some of the most famous video game music of all time. The Mario theme, Zelda theme, obviously. He learned the electric organ when he was only five years old, speaking of organ music right here, so... Didn't even need to bring in fluff for that one. As we exit the sanctuary, we're gonna hang a left right here, or a right I suppose if it's Link's perspective, stage right. We're gonna head north here though and take a little detour into the Lost Woods. We're gonna grab our first quarter heart piece, which Blaze will talk about. We got a full one you'll notice from the Sanctuary to add a, a heart to our overall total. Otherwise we can only ever get those from bosses, but that was the exception right there. I love that everyone knows us. Don't want to bum them out, tell them our uncle's dead. By the way, I guess we're just going to leave him to rot beneath the, the castle there, or to the side of the castle, wherever that is. Not a proper burial or anything. I understand we have other things to do, maybe not the top of our priority list, but maybe mention it to the, the priest at the sanctuary? I don't know. 
and cut right through here to pick up this mushroom and to tell us about the mushroom, here is Blaze. All right, the mushroom, we're gonna take this to the witch's hut and she'll give us something in return, but that is the sole purpose for the mushroom. All right, thanks, Blaze. So we have that now. We're gonna cut through this three by three bush patch right in the middle, drop down and get our first heart piece and Blaze. All right, four pieces of a heart equals one big heart. Collect four of these. You can add an extra heart onto your life bar, but uh, yeah, be on the lookout for these to get the maximum number of hearts in this game. There you go. We have all the locations of the heart pieces pretty much as soon as you can get each one of them. At least when you have access to each foursome of heart pieces to advance your total by another one. So now we're gonna exit the woods to the south this puts us out on the north side of Kakariko Village. We're just going to go down south here to enter the village. And then head to the northwesternmost corner of Kakariko, right here in the top left. Anytime there's not a guardrail in place, you can see there's kind of a chunk missing right here. That's a sign that we can jump off of the edge. And this puts us down in here, and we now have our first bombs of the game. Blaze? Bombs, you know how they work. Damage enemies, you can pick them up, throw them. They can open uh, certain blocked barriers in certain situations, the professor will point out. But there you go, bombs necessary in this game. Speaking of bombs, let's use one right here on this kind of crack in the wall. Go to the back of the room, in addition to making 10 bucks, we get another heart piece. So we're halfway to our fifth heart here in the game, our second Newhart overall. Just feel like I have to say Bob Newhart now for some reason, I just <laughs> couldn't help but hear that as I said it. Couple more things we need to do here in Kakariko Village before we head on out. Let's head into this place with a kind of a grass roof. Talk to this guy, gives us a little tip. This place used to be a hideout for thieves and their leader named Blind does not like the light. All right, good tip. We'll see if that comes back a little bit later. It will. If you do this puzzle right, you should be able to get all of the rupees down here. Man, yeah, I screwed up getting the other. Uh, those two. So if you mess it up like I did right there, you can just go back upstairs and come on right back. Before you leave, make sure you bomb through the wall here. And we're going to pick up yet another, well, 30 bucks, but also another piece of our heart. We're just one away now. In pretty good shape there. So again, we're going to go upstairs, come right back downstairs since I'm bad at planning. Maybe you got them all in the first try. Good for you if you did that. More effective is if we push this out of the way, and that's how you can get all four in one sitting without having to go up and come back down. You'd have to push that right one out of the way and then push the one in front of the, uh, the earlier one we got, but yeah, it's certainly possible. Get them all at once. Now we can pop in here, talk to this lady, ransack her her pots right here for what that's worth. Collecting victims. The master sword she's talking about. This is the first instance. Do you understand? Again, I I understand what you all are saying to me, but I can appreciate it. It's, you know, it's for the, the player. Just makes me laugh. See the kind of weather vane or whatever you want to call that in the center of town. We'll come back to that a little bit later. Pop into this house, talk to this kid. He's sick right now, unfortunately. If we come back with a bottle, he'll gift us something. Thankfully, a bottle's not too far away from here. And go in the back side of this tavern to get behind the counter. And how about that? When I said not far, a cucko right there just hanging out, tending bar I suppose, just waiting for a customer. I think Fluff has a fact about that, but we'll 
bring him in to talk about that a little bit later. For right now, let's talk to the kid again now that we're waking him up in short succession. Just what a sick person needs, but regardless, it's not about them, it's about us, and we have a bug net, Blaze. All right, the bug catching net, we can use this to grab fairies, bees, the magic bee, and uh, assuming you have a bottle, you can pop it in there, and uh, yeah, there you go, the bug catching net. Use it to catch bugs and fairies. And fairies, that's right. I love the, uh, the magic bee, the good bee, if you will. We'll find them a little bit later. Come up and talk to this merchant right here. He'll sell us our second bottle. It's good marketing, by the way. Blaze, what about the bottles? All right, the bottle. There are four bottles tucked away in Hyrule. We can use these to store potions, the red, the green, the blue, uh, fairies, bees, uh, even a fish in some situations. But there you go, the bottle. Yeah, you can make an argument that the bottles are among, if not the most important items in the game because you can stock up on life replenishing medicine. Let's drop a bomb right here. Our final bomb, unfortunately, but this is a good place to drop one, as you'll see. But fairies as well. Not sure how these rats got in here. The place is all boarded up, but thankfully we have more bombs and a bit of cash on top of that as well. Some arrows. Got our first arrows. Can't do much with them. Or anything, until we uh, get our bow, but we now have four bombs. Don't have a whole lot of those to go around early on in the game, so you gotta be very careful about where you're putting them down. Stop off and talk to this kid right here, and they will mark your map so we can find the Elder, who will be in the northeastern part of the world. There you go. With the X button right there. We'll get there before too long, just a couple more things. We can purchase medicine right there for 150. A little expensive. The red medicine will top off your health in full as opposed to, say, a fairy, which will just give you like about seven of your hearts back. Obviously not a issue for us right now, considering we only have four hearts. But the fairies are better because if you die, it automatically uses one for you, whereas if you fail to use your red medicine, that's not going to pop out of the jar and force its way down your throat to bring you back to life. So, much prefer having those fairies to uh, save you from death. When you least expect it, you know? It's like life insurance, essentially. So we're going to head to the bottom right to exit the main part of Kakariko Village. And we're going to pick up the final piece of a heart for this four cycle. Make sure you have a bomb on hand, and we can cut through here. You can talk to this kid, he's feuding with his brother, I can relate. I have an older brother. Never went to the lengths that these guys did. Barricading up the door. This kid, I feel like, didn't have access to any food in his side of the house. Not that I saw any of the other. you think they would give us something for patching up their relationship, but at least we can cut through here and They'll time you, give you 15 seconds to get to the finish line. This is the fastest route right here. You can pick up that sign or you can just go down south right there. Talk to this guy. We did it in 10 seconds. With 5 seconds to spare, we have our first full heart piece that we get from those individual heart pieces. Add it to our total overall, so that's a good start. Give us a little more padding for taking damage as we're headed to our first dungeon now in a roundabout way this is going to take us a little while to get there so just follow along and i'm told fluff has a fluff fact about the sanctuary fluff we know it as the sanctuary but in the japanese super famicom release this building is referred to as the church this change in the localization was another instance of nintendo's international policy on forbidding and removing religious imagery from their games speaking of which this game is called Legend of Zelda Triforce of Gods in Japan. A little too religious for Nintendo of America's tastes, it was renamed to the punny Link to the Past for Western audiences. Thanks, Fluff. I know you got a, another fact later on in this class about the title of the game and how it relates to something that... Well, yeah, we'll, we'll get to it a little later on. Obviously, also, this is the sort of a, a prequel or quite literally is it takes place earlier on in the timeline uh so there's that too but um 
before the, the NES titles. But anyway, we are about to reach the witch. This is her hut right here. We got that mushroom from the Lost Woods earlier, so let's get that from our inventory and give it to her with Y. So if we head inside, we can see her assistant has a few things to sell. Slightly better prices on the, the medicine if you're going to buy medicine. This is the place to grab it, but uh, if you want to get what she promised us, simply leave the screen to the left and then come back. And then head inside, and then this time, right there, the magic powder, please. All right, the magic powder, which we get for exchanging the mushroom, we can use this on certain enemies and they'll change shape, uh, sometimes for a laugh, other times to uh, turn some enemies into very useful fairies, which you can bottle up or uh, just grab to give yourself some health. But there you go, the magic powder. Thank you very much, Blaze. Yeah, most useful on the kind of spinning and I mean, we'll, we'll point them out a little bit later. Certain enemies in the dungeons that we come across, we can sprinkle some on them and they'll turn into a fairy, which we can grab with our our bug net, which we got earlier. And uh, assuming you have a bottle for you can store a fairy. Saves you from death. Again, that's the best part about it. You don't get all the life back that you would with a potion, but at least you don't have to reach in your inventory and pull out some medicine, so. I'm lazy. That's why I like the fairies. Anyway, coming up on the Eastern Palace here. First, we need to check in with Sahasrala. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that correctly, but here he is. I always like to walk right by him and immediately blow a hole in his wall right here via a bomb. Imagine that, going over to someone's house and just immediately, not even saying hi first, but we get 50, and another 50. So, Sahasrala's life savings right here, but anyway, he's a descendant of the seven wise men. So he's a little skeptical of us at first. So we need to basically prove something to him first by going to the Eastern Palace and just basically surviving. He, I'm pretty sure he thinks we're going to die. <laughs> That's fine. He doesn't know us from Adam or any of these random Kakariko people. We'll show him. I mean, we'll get lost, run into a dead end, but eventually we'll show him. Go around this way, just kind of smack the enemies out of the way again. No real incentive to actually kill anything if they take more than one or two shots. Unless they're really blocking our way. Just climb the ruins here. And we're entering our first proper temple, the Eastern Temple. Although I suppose, strictly speaking, it's our first palace. They call them palaces. They really need to settle on a concept in these Zelda games. Sometimes dungeons, sometimes temples, sometimes palaces. Come on now. It's like the debate between the boss of the dungeon or the level or the master of the level. I've brought that up before. Here we can use little cubbies to avoid the balls, although if you just kind of alternate left and right, you don't have to worry about that. We'll never see that kind of trap again, and they give you a big one every now and then, but if you're quick, you don't have to even worry about ducking into the cubbies. Gonna be showing you the most direct route through this first dungeon. I'm sorry, palace. <laughs> Can't help myself. I've called it, mistakenly called it a temple and the dungeon, all in about three minutes time here, but we're gonna take the top door in this room so that we can grab the map for this palace. Got it right that time. And if we duck in here, we can also grab our first magic powdered fairy, so gotta make sure you have a bottle open. We have a couple empty bottles right here. So we'll pull out our magic powder, very quickly transition to your bug catching net. Sometimes the fairy will as it almost happened there, fly right into you and you'll get the health back as opposed to storing it, which is what we want it to do. And in this next room, we'll get our our map for this first proper palace. Now with an overview of the items of the dungeons, palaces, what have you, 
Here's Blaze. All right, let's cover the items you will find in the dungeons of The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. First, the map shows you the screens you haven't been to yet, so you have a better idea of how this dungeon is laid out. The compass shows you where the, uh, the, the dungeon master, the boss, is. Not that useful considering we got you covered, the map and the compass, in these dungeons, but that's fine. Then we have the key. The small key opens the locked doors. And then uh, this is a single use. Once you unlock the door, the key just breaks. That's unfortunate. <laughs> then we have the big key, which is used to access the special chest and the boss door. Only way to get to the boss and get the special item of the dungeon is getting that big key. Thank you, Blaze. Yeah, whenever I have enemies that take more than one hit with whatever sword that we have at the time, and you got these pots around, it's just a bit more efficient to do that. Another instance where I have to clear out all the enemies before the door will open. This should be our compass. There we go. Again, not that big of a deal for our purposes since we're we know where we're going with this walkthrough as it is, but we can talk to Sahasrala through these things on the wall, these tablets. We're gonna head to the right here. And you'll notice we have the giant chest right here, which we need the special lock to open. Which we don't have at this time, so we're gonna go up these stairs, pop down here, and grab ourselves a couple fairies. I think we only have space for one right now, but I never like to leave one fairy alone. I don't know, it's just... Just my personal creed. No fairy left behind. Seems very lonely just to have the one fairy, so. Eh? It's locked? Yeah, we gotta get the big key. So now we'll be underneath, if we go through here, the platforming area that we were up top on earlier. This is obviously one of the least complicated palaces, or you could argue the least complicated, being the first one. If those little fidget spinner type enemies, if they hit you, they will sap a little bit of your magic. More annoying than anything. We have a key underneath this pot here. Sure we didn't miss anything. Now we're gonna head to the left. The pressure switch does not matter. We needed the key from that last room to unlock this one right here. You'll find that because we're gonna be showing you generally the most direct route in these palaces, temples, dungeons, that uh, you will sometimes have a surplus of keys at the end of the area when you leave. Unfortunately, these can't be applied to subsequent dungeons. Kind of annoying in that way, but uh, could save us a little bit of time, but I guess, yeah, they have a different set of locks for all these different palaces, so. There you go. Once you kill that final enemy, they will clear off of the pot that we need to get the big key right here. The master key of the dungeon. Useful on doors with this giant keyhole, or big, to use the game's terminology. And we'll push through here to have a little shortcut back to this room that we were in earlier with this tablet. Head to the right, and we'll get our treasure of this dungeon. And that treasure is... Blaze, what do we got? All right, the bow shoots out arrows, a classic in the Legend of Zelda series. Certainly is, and we've been stocking up on arrows. More powerful than our crappy little sword right here, so if you just feel like getting some practice in right now, especially on these sleeping giant eye enemies, no harm in that. These pots still work pretty well on them. Certain enemies can only be defeated by the bow. We need to defeat this enemy down here to grab a key. Just wake him up and smack him with this pot right here. Rude awakening. And before we head through that locked door, 
We're gonna pop in this right door here. Gonna get a mini payday. 90 bucks, just like that. And if you need some fairies, you can use the magic powder right there to replenish and restock both of your bottles. Not too far to get to the boss from here. And they're not throwing anything too complicated at us at this point. In subsequent dungeons, we'll have to move statues around to weight down those switches. These are called Igors, these enemies here. Fitting name, especially when we get through with them. You don't see too many of these style of switches later in the game either. Always the last one. Not too difficult to avoid those balls. I did say that was the last time we'd be seeing them. I mean in this dungeon, this is the last point we'll be seeing them. Gotta use our arrows here. A couple arrows will take down the, the red eye gore. Oftentimes when they put one of those fancy tiles down in front of a door, fancy rugs, and you know you're getting very close to the boss, if not on the next screen. Let's wake these guys up, get a couple shots in. Need any refilling of your health, arrows, this is the room to do it in. And now let's turn it over for the first time in this class to our resident boss expert, Gary, for our first boss beater. It's Scary Gary's Boss Beaters. Right, the first proper boss in A Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past, the Armos Knights. The most effective and efficient way to take them out is with the arrows. You can safely attack them from a distance with your arrows, especially when they all line up against that back wall. But three shots per night will take them down and make very easy work of this boss. When that last one gets a little excited, you can uh, switch to your, your spin attacks at this point, but not too difficult the first boss in Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. Thank you very much, Gary. I never used the arrows in the past, but yeah, I could see they're much more efficient than getting that spin attack working for us. A lot less planning involved here. Grab the first of three pendants. Celebrate for a second. It's a big moment for young Link. Pendant of Courage. Now we're going to go back and see Sahasrala. Tell him how wrong he was. Really rub it in his face. I really don't think that he thought we were going to survive that challenge. How about that? So more pendants to get, maidens to rescue in the future, but he does give us a sweet pair of kicks. Blaze? All right, the Pegasus boots. We can use these to uh, break open some rocks, push back a tombstone in one instance. Uh, more than that, it just makes getting around the world in The Legend of Zelda a little bit more fun. And just hold down that A button for a second. The annoying bit is that instant where he needs to, I don't know, get some friction on the ground or something before he actually gets moving, but yeah, I'd say most of the time it's generally faster just to use that A, even with that slight delay in mind, than walking around. This is a fun screen to do it on, kind of Plinko style as we work our way through the gaps. Cross the popsicle stick bridge. And we're going to head pretty directly to the next palace, but along the way we can grab another piece of heart and another useful item, which uh, we'll need for the remainder of this game, which we can pick up along the way. So use our dash move on this collection of rocks right here. There you go. I don't know who's maintaining these torches everywhere, but thanks. Much appreciate it. Anytime you see a rock formation like that, you can uh, dash through it. It's pretty much only one or two more instances where we actually want to do it, but just know that you have that option. 
It's the only rocks we can really deal with at this stage in the game. Before we get a little more equipment. I'm going to stop off in Kakariko and talk to someone we have not talked to yet. This gentleman right here. He wants to run away from you as soon as he does. Hit that A button, hold it down. You'll catch up to him. He just gives you a tip that you can bash in the trees and stuff like that and knock things out of them. There's nothing all that important from knocking a tree. Every now and then a bomb will come out or sometimes some rupees. A couple other items here and there, but yeah, you're not going to find any heart pieces or anything like that from bashing into a normal tree, that is. Stop off in the library here. Dash against... This bookshelf, and what do we get, Blaze? The Book of Madura allows you to read the Hylian writing on certain sections of this game, certain tablets, things like that. Make sure you grab this. Can't beat the game without it. Good tip. Thank you very much, Blaze. Now we're pretty much set to uh, continue on to the Desert Palace. We'll stop through the swamp along the way. We can grab one more heart piece. Again, always got to take the long way at this stage in the game. A lot of obstacles barring our way. You have things like posts, rocks in the case of that last screen. Sometimes a gap you can't get across unless you have subsequent items, so... There's some of those posts right there. We can't swim yet. Getting close, though. Once you have 500 rupees, you can purchase something which will aid in our ability to swim. Let's grab this chest first. This should just be a collection of bombs right here. Three bombs. Like in the picture, it's three bombs, and we literally get three bombs. We'll take it. Before too long, we'll be upgrading our supply of bombs and arrows so that we don't have to be quite as conservative with them. Pull the right one to actually open the dam right here at the gate. This will just drop some uh, some traps on you in the form of bombs. But once we've opened up that gate right there, you'll see that the water has been drained. And underneath the water was a piece of heart. We can also grab a fish right here. We can put one in a bottle, or we can just take it up here and be a nice guy and drop it in the water. Where'd uh? Gives us 20 bucks for doing the right thing. Nice to see. All right, so we'll keep swinging wide down here to the southwest. Now we're getting to the desert portion right next to the swamp. We'll find a mute man or a sleeping man, I suppose. <laughs> Middle-aged man. <laughs> I suppose he's asleep. I always took that as meaning he was just not very communicative and wanted to be left alone. If he needs some health can regain it from the uh, the ferry right there. There's a few of those stashed all around Hyrule. Watch out for those bits underneath the sand, those landmines. Watch out for the cacti as well. Very prickly. It'll knock you back, especially if you're a fan of running everywhere as I am and you're not being too careful. So we got the book, he's just telling you that you can uh, contact, communicate with the, the Hylia people. Reminds me of the Let's Play with Brigands school for gifted Hylians that we did as a fun little intro to our original Legend of Zelda walkthrough here on Video Games 101. Again, link in the description, or in the playlist in the description. It's actually a heart piece back in that cave. We'll be grabbing it on the way out. Um, it won't be the, the fourth to complete the heart, so we'll come back and grab that once we have a third one on the way out. Use the book right here on this stone. Need this to gain access to the, the desert palace, which is right behind the stones here. Will this not go away unless I hit a button? It's a very long, awkward amount of time here. All right, I guess we got to hit something. And these statues here will shift. 
be funny if it stopped right there. There you go, now we can't get out the other way. Only way to go is forward. There is a way to get out of the temple, but, I mean, palace, but we, uh, we're not too concerned about that right now, so the fastest route to go, we're gonna take out one of those pots here. We just stab, they're called devil ants, these little sand pit creatures that pop up, just stand to the side once they pop up and stab to take them down. We can charge into this torch right here. Grab our first key. And we're gonna cross. There's nothing in that room up above us right there. He's our key right here. Grab the compass from this room. And once we take out all these enemies, we can head through this door and we're just gonna charge from the bottom. Sometimes we can avoid getting shot if you get the timing just right. Doesn't necessarily work on the way out, but I'm impatient, so. Again, more of those bowling balls, I suppose. I may have spoken too soon, <laughs> saying we would never see those again, but just not in the uh, not in the use that we saw in that first palace, but. So actually I neglected to pop into this top room on the way as we were running by. This is where we can find the map. These are called levers, these enemies which burrow out of the ground. They come in a different, couple different varieties, like the Igors, the less dangerous greens, and the more dangerous require two hits reds. A nice assortment of them right there. And now that we have the fancy key, pick up this pot, hit the pressure switch, and we have our very easy to get item of this dungeon. What do we got, Blaze? I had the power glove. It's so bad. I'm sorry, I couldn't resist it, but this allows Link to pick up the light colored rocks all around Hyrule and the Dark World. Uh, the light and the dark world, the small and the big ones, doesn't seem to make a difference. Can't pick them up without it. Access new areas with the power glove. Yeah. Pretty good delivery. Right up there with Lucas himself. Good call, Blaze. We come all the way down to the bottom now and cut through. If you need any health, push this block right here and we can head through this door where we'll find a couple fairies flying around. Needed that half heart, so ended up grabbing them both, but... And we can exit... The advancing way to exit the temple is through this door right here to be at the top. Careful when you're running here, you don't want to fall off the edge. Run to that piece of heart. There's our third. So we'll grab that fourth one on the way out, but uh, we can throw these rocks out of the way with our power glove. Mine the sentry statue right here. And we want to push, I think it's the right one. As soon as it lines up with you, it fires a very powerful beam shot at you, which does a decent amount of damage, so. We don't have to actually hang out and fight these tiles in this case. Sometimes we need to wait and destroy them all to open a door, but in this case, we just grab that key from the bottom left. Give you a tip on how to deal with that a little bit later as we have to fight them, but these enemies are called popos, I believe. The ones that look like little living presents, for lack of a better. They look like gift-wrapped boxes, a little bow on top, but they're kind of alive. It's very strange. It's the twisted mind of the people at Nintendo. Lighting all these won't do anything in this case. They don't start throwing that at you until a little bit later. We still have the training wheels on where they're just hiding keys and pots. Another instance where the tiles are going to be coming at you. Another instance where we don't have to hang out. Let's just cut on right through here. We have a red eye gourd to deal with here. Only the arrows will do. Don't really have to worry about him though. This is an instance where we do need to light all the torches and you'll see the wall back away and reveal 
That's right, the path to the next boss. Let's throw it back to Gary for our next boss beater. Boss beaters. All right, land molas, these underground worm-like boss creatures. You want to charge that spin attack when the boss is underground. Use the spin attack when they pop out. Just stay to the bottom or side when they come out to avoid the dirt that, that shoots out diagonally. And you can get extra hits in before they go back underground, but just rinse and repeat the strategy. You'll take them down. Thank you, Gary. Yeah, not a difficult battle, just kind of a frustrating one when you don't get all the hits in that you want. Stand underneath or to the side, as Gary mentioned. Then there's a rehash very late in the game where we have to fight these first three palace bosses once again. Of course, the trade-off is we have a much more powerful sword at that time, so while the bosses may be slightly more difficult to take on, they're actually not because we'll have the most powerful weapon in the game by that point, but... Getting ahead of ourselves. Still probably only about 15% the way through this game at this point. As we grab another full heart, we're about to grab that last quarter piece that we need, so we'll be in good shape in terms of hearts with eight in just a moment. So we got the Pendant of Courage before, the blue one is the Pendant of Power. So I'm assuming in Zelda terms, the final pendant will be that of Wisdom, to echo the Triforce. Just dive off the right at this point, and yeah, let's just pop back in this gentleman's little cave dwelling. Use our bombs on the bottom wall right here. Realized I missed this as soon as we entered the temple before. Our final destination will be in the north-easternmost part of Hyrule, at Death Mountain. A few errands to run before we head up there. We can now pick up the light-colored rocks, as Blades mentioned, now that we have the Power Glove. So, certainly some more secrets to be uncovered here in Hyrule. We've got one, actually, just as we're leaving the desert. We can't get up to that... That stone at this stage. Be able to get up there a little bit later. So let's test out the glove on this very heavy rock right here. Head down inside. And we have a thief hideout right here. And with it, about, what, 50, 50 some rupees? Or 50 on the nodes. All right, we have some traveling to do, so while you're following along with us as we head northeast, let's throw it to Fluff for another Fluff fact about this game. Entering a house in the northwest part of Kakariko Village and picking up a certain pot will reveal a cuckoo. Sprinkling some magic powder on the cuckoo will cause it to transform into a woman. She explains that the weathercock in the center of town watches Link and punishes him if he abuses the cuckoos. So, if you ever wondered where all those cuckoos are coming from, there you go. Thanks, Fluff. I always liked the dramatic zoom in in Ocarina of Time when you stab some cuckoos. <laughs> and eventually the cuckoos just had enough. And they just zoom right in on it, and it just does that cry. And uh, Link's like, uh-oh. <laughs> And then suddenly you just get swarmed a second later. They come from all directions. I like that they kept that going throughout the series. Don't abuse cuckoos. That's all we're saying. So now we can clear out this boulder here. So this will be a very valuable detour before we head up to Death Mountain. We're combining our power glove with our, our boots right here. Careful about stabbing those pickle-looking enemies. They will electrocute you when you stab them. Leave them be and just head up to the falls here. Take this route. It's the most direct route to get to Zora. You should have 500 rupees by now. Just 
through the course of killing enemies and accessing the secret areas that we've shown you so far. Probably have quite a bit more if you've been taking a bit more time and taking down enemies. Go all the way down to the bottom route. I don't know why the sound of the falls here, just something very relaxing about being up here in uh, the pool of Zora. Approach this waterfall here and Zora will appear from the water. Little man. 500 rupees. The most expensive purchase in the game, but well worth it. It's tough seeing our wallet take that hit, but uh, anyway, tell us about the flippers, Blaze. Zora's flippers! Extremely expensive at 500 rupees, but they allow Link to instantly learn how to swim. Grab the flippers if you've got the scratch. Thank you, Blaze. Yeah, exit south there and head along this path so you can get to this middle ground and grab this heart piece. If only it were that simple, though. My parents spent a lot of money on swimming lessons for me. It took me a while to get the hang of it. I was terribly afraid of the water for a couple of years, and then just, I don't know, one year it just clicked for me. And I could go into the deep end without freaking out. I'm going to pop in through this waterfall right here. A little secret area. A mysterious pond, so we can throw in a couple items in particular and possibly get something better in return. We're going to start with the boomerang, and by possibly I mean, of course, definitely. I like an honest person. Why would you say no in that instance? We're just polluting your pond and lying about it. Blaze? The magic boomerang, an upgrade to the basic boomerang. It's the same thing, just covers a bit more distance. Won't be using it too much, especially when you have the hook shot, but in certain instances, the magic boomerang is what you need. I just hang out here for another second. They'll prompt you again, and this time, we're gonna toss in our shield and get an upgrade here as well, Blaze. All right, the fire shield, an upgrade here. We can now deflect, protect ourselves from enemy fireballs much more protective than that crappy shield our uncle left us. Again, sorry, Unc. Sorry, Unc, indeed. So as part of the flippers, you can take these whirlpools, which will warp you to different points around the map. Before we head up to that island, we're going to swim all the way around this way, up through this little channel right here. It's a bit of a swim, but this is going to be well worth it. we go under the bridge right here, the enemies still try to come after you. Don't think they understand how height works. Wake this man up from his slumber. I like this guy. He's the most chill guy in all of Hyrule. Everybody knows me still. <laughs> Gives us our third magic bottle, though. That'd be one instance where I'd be thinking, not everything has to be magical in this game. Developers of Link to the Past, you know? <laughs> A bottle can just be a bottle. It doesn't have to be a magic bottle. It's a magic bow. It's a ma no. It's it's just it's just a bow. It's just a bomb. It kills things. It does its job. But anyway, yeah, we can store stuff in it. Pretty good shape once you have three bottles. Just keep them stocked with three fairies. It's pretty hard to lose at that point, especially if you're following this guide. Swim down to the right here, and we're gonna. Pop out of the water and grab another item if we head up to the north here. Actually, speaking of one of our empty bottles, first things first, let's blow a hole through the wall right here. So many secret area sounds at once. Just 20 bucks right here. Not quite as fancy as the one down south. That's alright, I'm happy to take your life savings, thief guy. This is sort of the back secret entrance to the little ice cave right here. And Blaze? Alright, not as useful as the fire rod, but the ice rod can freeze enemies, and it's necessary for taking down one boss in particular, but there you go, the ice rod. Won't get as much use out of it, nearly as much use as the fire rod, but 
It looks cool. Looks good in your inventory. There you go. Yeah, we're never going to be using this, but uh, save for that one boss. Use your dash on this statue here in the, the normal way of going in, and you'll see a, a special bee. It's got a little kind of a magical trail behind it. This is called the good bee, and the good bee, once you release it, will fight your enemies for you. So if we pull it out of its bottle, it will, uh, yeah, just start going out, trying to protect us. It's not all that powerful. It has another purpose, which we'll cover a little bit later, but I just like to keep that good bee with me at all times. If you ever lose the good bee, it will return to that same initial area where we got it, so for what that's worth. So we used the whirlpool right there to take a shortcut up here to the entrance of Death Mountain. Toss this out of the way. Back at Lake Hylia with that island that we neglected to go into. And uh, it's kind of a maze in here, so follow this course to successfully exit this area. You'll run to this older gentleman here who will help kind of guide you a little bit. Yeah, you need some cash to take full advantage of that island at the uh, Lake Hylia, so we'll cover that a little bit later, once we get our rupee stockpile stockpiled once again. Yeah, not too difficult to navigate the caves right there. We are very high up if uh, the, the sky or ground or whatever you want to call that is any indication. Got the mirror, Blaze. All right, the magic mirror allows you to transport yourself from the dark world back to the light world. You can also use this to return to the entrance of dungeons. Very handy. Thank you very much, Blaze. Shame we can't go between both dimensions at will with this mirror, but that would make it a little bit too easy. We can only access the dark world from the light world by way of special portals, which we're about to come up on right here. And yeah, maybe someone from class can better as we drop off right here. You'll see we have a few opportunities to do so. This is the one that, the first one which we actually want to do because you'll see if we come up here and head upstairs. We get a piece of heart right here. Halfway to another one. And just drop down here. Got some fairies to the right. We'll leave a couple. They can be friends, have someone to talk to, or at least flutter around. This will pop us out on the uh, next platform over to the left. So let's drop off and then head back up the stairs once again, or the ladder. It's not any faster to dash on a ladder than it is to walk, so... I suppose those are maybe minerals in the mountain, or it's, I'm not really sure what those are meant to be. Maybe someone from class can elaborate on those and what we were seeing with the, the twinkly darkness down below, whereas we have clouds up above. But we are in the dark world for the first time. Mr. Bunny. <laughs> Change our shape to reflect like our true form. So we're a, a little cute little bunny, I guess. This guy's a big bully. Kind of a triceratops looking two leg walking bully that just kicks around the uh, the ball character. So use our mirror right there to find ourselves back on top in the light world. We grab that piece of heart. We're gonna head right into the third palace right here. The Tower of Hera specifically, I believe it's called. So you'll find if we hit these switches right here that it changes the the block barrier positioning, whether they are raised or below so we can walk over them. We can also use our boomerang to toss right over top and then proceed that way, making it 
much more easy to get around. Blaze already told us that, but thank you, Sahasrala. Find these little Triceratop guys. Grab the map right away here at the Tower of Hera. Use our key, and we're going to head down one floor. So we need to hit the switch to access this door, but the door will not open until the last tile has been destroyed. So, usually the strategy is position yourself against a wall, and you'll notice that Link swings his sword from left to right, and we can kind of use this to protect ourselves from anything coming to the right, not so much those above us in that instance, but as you can see, just by virtue of the the motion of the sword swing itself. We're covered from a lot of angles, so it's just important to be aware of where you're positioning yourself, and then obviously getting the timing right too, so you don't get smacked in the face. These tiles do a decent chunk of damage, one heart, each time they hit you. No need to fight any enemies in here. Little tail worms. Sometimes when they give you magic in a room, that's an indication that you need to uh, pull out your torch or your fire rod, which we'll get a little bit later. Light all of these to get the big key for this dungeon. Won't be getting a fun item in this dungeon, but her palace or tower. <laughs> Gotta stop doing that. But uh, it's it's more of a just a, a passive item that we need to advance the game, essentially. Let's go ahead and hit this so we can get past. Might have just been able to throw our boomerang over top, but don't know that it would have had the distance. So we'll hit that so we can cross over here and then head upstairs. I suppose this would be the third floor here. Careful about these gaps. It'll drop you down to the floor beneath you. Sometimes you want to line these up because there's an area you can only access by dropping in from the floor above you. Is I right to hit that switch? Yes, we were. So you can hit that to change the orientation of the pits. Those little star blocks right there. Star tiles. Hit that again just so we can advance right here. To actually get the big treasure of this particular area, we will need to drop in from above. You can kind of make a note of where you need to drop in as you head up to the next floor. It's a compass right there. So we can't get over there just yet, even if we hit that star tile right there. We're going to need to head upstairs. So we need a pit, which is sort of in the top of this screen right here. So we're going to hit this star, and you can see it opened one up right there. That's the one we're going to need to go through. Oh. <laughs> That's a good way to get hurt. Walking backwards downstairs. I guess he corrected himself between floors right there, but. It reset it. I'm gonna hit that again. Ignore the enemies this time. Just go in, drop in from the top right here. You can drop in from the bottom, you'll fall on the star, so. And there's our treasure, Blaze. All right, the Moon Pearl prevents Link from changing form into that cute little bunny, so maybe not the best item. Kind of like that bunny, but uh, there you go, the Moon Pearl. Use this to maintain your shape in the Dark World. Just a passive item. Yeah, like I said, not fun, but necessary for completing the game. Is what it is. Plenty of hearts to be had here if you need to top yourself off as we get ready for the next boss. Let's uh, send it back to Gary for our strategies on this one. Gary? Boss Beater! The Moldorm! 
charge that spin attack and stay to the left of the pit. If you get knocked down, you gotta come all the way back up and they got all their health back, the boss does, so. You wanna uh, avoid getting knocked off, avoid the sides, obviously, but if you stay to the side of the pit and just emerge when you see the tail at the bottom or the top, away from the head, you can unleash your, uh, your spin attack, get a hit in, and then retreat back to the left. Sometimes the boss will go back in that area, but uh, it's a lot less frequent than when he stays to the right. Just repeat this strategy, watch out for those sides of the pit when he's going a little crazier there at the end, and you'll take him down. Thank you, Gary. Yeah, usually the, the safest way to do it. Moveset is very unpredictable, though, so it's a little too easy to get knocked down to the floor beneath you and have him regenerate all that health, but... Wouldn't think that red would be the color of wisdom. I don't know. Associate that more with courage. Just... But there you go. Pendant of wisdom. We got the three. We can now head to the Lost Woods and upgrade our sword finally. And we're slumming it with the crappy little... May as well be made of wood, as far as I'm concerned. But, uh... There you go. There was another item at the top left if we had head straight west from the tower, but you need to have the Master Sword to get it, so we're just going to cut through here, and this is going to lead us back outside, essentially. Do a dash and make sure you pull out at the last second, otherwise you can knock off the wall and kind of shoot yourself back into the, uh, the pit behind you. But it's very convenient in that this shoots us out right outside of the Lost Woods. So we can head right on inside. We just kind of popped in here for a second earlier to what, grab a piece of heart, maybe a couple rupees in that mushroom, of course. This time we're gonna press on beyond where that mushroom was found. There's a lot of fake Mount Master Swords. Here's the real one. And you can only pull this out once you have all three pendants. Here goes nothing. Sweet. Feel that power surging. Doesn't really make evil retreat. I kind of get where he's going with it, but yeah, most enemies completely undaunted by our possession of the Master Sword. <laughs> but that's fine. What also is fine is that the fog has been lifted from the Lost Woods. It look oh. Aye, all right. Yeah, that sounds important. We'll get right on it. But, uh, Blaze, how about that sword? All right, the Master Sword, the Sacred Blade of Legend, does twice as much damage as that crappy sword that our late uncle left to us. Uh, still not the most powerful sword in the game, but we'll talk about that later. But the Master Sword, the only way to take on the upcoming boss battle with Aghanim. But I'll leave that to Gary. Thank you, Blaze. Before we head to the Sanctuary, we're gonna do a quick detour. Let's also get a quick fluff fact about the Master Sword. In the French version of A Link to the Past, the Master Sword was named Excalibur after King Arthur's legendary sword, a name which was continued on in the French versions of Wind Waker as well as Twilight Princess. Good call. Thank you, Fluff. Yeah, that is a cooler name for it. I always like in these games where it's this sword that the entire plot revolves around it's so important so legendary and yet it's not the most powerful sword in the game i mean you can get it upgraded a couple times in this game yeah what, what's going on down there with those uh with the, the twinklies it's like the bottom of the mountain is in space but the top of the mountain is back within the atmosphere i don't really understand what point they're trying to make there. So again, if uh, anyone wants to, if you just want to throw out the generic, it's magic professor, just leave it at that, just like your bottle. <laughs> That's fine. 
head back into the dark world. Just a quick detour before we head back to the sanctuary. See if we can keep our shape this time, which helps us use more items and things like that. Got the moon pearl, huh? Surprised they don't jump me for it. They seem content to just, I don't know, kick around. Quite literally in that one guy's case. You see the portal still remains when we use the magic mirror to go from the dark to the light. But now that we have the master sword, pull out our book. And we will grab the magic of ether. Blaze, what can you tell us about the ether medallion? All right, the ether medallion necessary for accessing one of the dungeons uh, sends out some projectiles and it can uh, change enemies into different forms. But uh, yeah, can't beat the game without the ether medallion. Yep, very important medallion for the plot of the game. Looks cool too. Always my brother's favorite of the magics. We were kids, that was a quake guy. We'll get to the quake in a bit. Again, pull out. There you go. That's why you need to pull out of that run there at the end. But now we can head back to the sanctuary. For plot purposes, I can understand getting there as quickly as possible, but... And we don't even need to stop off for the ether right now, but uh, it's not a whole lot which is going to take us back up the Death Mountain anytime soon, so you might as well grab it then. Hopefully Zelda's alright. Oh, she's not, and this guy's dead. Or dying. Oh, a second two in her. I guess we shouldn't have stopped off. <laughs> like the Simpsons monorail episode, I'm sorry. Shouldn't have stopped off for that haircut. <laughs> Such a, a dire time. Alright, so we're going to head back to the castle now. Do this little cut-through area that we never come through otherwise. You can see that these green soldiers, we can kill them with one hit now. Very satisfying. I like the blue color on that sword as well. Head on right through the front door. This time we're going to cut to the left. I'm going to head up some stairs and go outside of the castle. We could have come out here before, but unless you have the Master Sword, you can't break through this barrier. But just as we have it, just stab it, walk on right through. And we're heading up Aghanim's Tower here. Kind of a mini dungeon. It's a couple keys, but there's no map, there's no big key or a compass, anything like that. And it's all relatively linear, so. Love that instant kill on a lot of enemies when we charge up that master sword. Also shoots out the, uh, the, the beam shots once we have it, our full health. Pretty weak, the uh, the beam shot, but beats having to pull out a boomerang or something like that, and actually does inflict damage on all enemies. Just takes a while for most enemies. It's a key in that chest over there on the left. We don't need the light; it's just kind of helpful for seeing. maze-like area right here. Seems like we could just step over these little barriers, but again, with the perspective, it's, I suppose, hard to tell. Don't need to fight these guys, just walk on through. Careful step in here. Don't get knocked off. Hmm. 
Just have to kill this one enemy to get the key in this area. Don't have to worry about the other two. Thankfully, they have their own natural lighting here with the windows. Always in these games, I can't help but think about the commute for the enemies. Agnim himself is equal having to walk through the dark every time he, you know, wants to go out, grab a bite in Kakariko Village or something like that. What have you? Stop off at the pharmacy, get some medicine, whatever he's got to do. I don't know what the man does in his spare time when he's not trying to take over the world, presumably. But uh, yeah, just seems a bit of a hassle. Does he have keys for all these doors? Maybe he's got a, a master key, a skull key. Skeleton key, I should say. Or maybe he just does the classic teleport magic solution, and I'm overthinking it. It's gotta be deflating if you're an enemy. Spent all that time training under Aghanim for this one moment of taking on Link, stopping him before he gets to the top of the tower and we just walk right by him and they say oh all right well then <laughs> wasn't expecting that let's go get a bite here he is again it's that trope of yeah let's just stand here while the evil guy does his thing which we could easily stop right now if we just <laughs> moved around and stabbed him and said no don't do that. Bad Aghanim. But there you go. <laughs> Silliness. Not on our watch. Kind of like that we have to stab the, the curtains here to get to them. And with tips on how to take down Aghanim, let's throw it back to Gary. Boss beaters. All right, Aghanim. You want to slap his ball shots right back at him. You want to probably get close to ensure that they'll actually hit him instead of going wide. But uh, avoid his smaller shots pretty much altogether. You can't knock those back to hurt him. And uh, just get to the side when he goes to the top and center of the screen, because that means his lightning attack's coming, and it does the most damage. But yeah, easily avoid it at the sides. Repeat the strategy until he's down. Thank you, Gary. Not too difficult in the least. Just need the Master Sword, obviously, to do this. Lightning's coming. Just step out of the way. It's not that powerful. It's not like a one-shot kill or anything, but... Not like Shredder hitting you with his mutagen shot and... Reverting you back to a baby turtle. Just takes a while. There we go. Well met. Add him to the pile of countless baddies who just refuse to alter their strategy one bit when they can tell it's not working, you know, 10 seconds into the battle. <laughs> Maybe I should vary this up. So we're now in what was formerly the Golden Land. We're now in the Dark World. I guess we won't tell Sahasrala that we've already been here, technically. Up in the Death Mountain area. So we have this marked on our map. Let's do it. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like and comment on this video, and click subscribe if you haven't already, as this seriously helps me to keep making great content for you. And check the description of this video to see what song is playing right now.